Could you imagine the audacity of barely escaping the other world with your life and having to sacrifice your only friend in Oregon in that process just to get home and realize that your parents weren't worried sick about you? They weren't even looking for you because they aren't home at all. They're probably out having fun at a dance party. That's what Coraline just slid into home base to find. A whole lot of nothing waiting for her at home. I'd be standing there like, I ran through all these cobwebs for this? Even the black cat, who seemed so interested in Coraline before, isn't hanging around to offer any clues. And that kitty has been stalking her every moment up until now, so where is he? This is a truly weird experience, and it only gets weirder as the awkward neighbor kid shows up. Hey guys, this is the fangirl. I'm McGann, and kindly leave me a comment as to whether you watch or only listen to my videos. So like I was saying, Coraline just flooped herself out of an otherworld tunnel that looked nothing like the one that she'd entered through, and now, suspiciously, Coraline can't find anyone inside of her apartment. She asks if anyone is home in the hallway while looking quite happy to be back, no responses. She playfully calls out, hello, 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 a bunch of times up the stairwell, which echoes pretty loudly, but nada. And actually, this is a really good shot to pause and compare to the Otherworld staircase. We got to see the Otherworld stairs right after Coraline was offered the button eyes. And I didn't mention this before, but the hallway with the mirror has a strange picture on the wall of the pink palace. And when we see the stairway before that, the pictures there, appear to be two paintings or photographs of the Pink Palace. And then there's some weird house doorway portal looking image. It kind of looks like a doorway that's leading you through another doorway where all these fantastical things are happening. And it has a super creepy vibe. But when you compare the other world stairs with what are supposed to be the real world stairs, the carpet in the other world is totally different. And in the real world, we have some such a masterpiece of details going on. Oh my gosh, the animators put a shine on the second story wood floors. The carpet on the steps have worn spots. There's spider webs on the lighting fixture. And we can see where pictures used to be on the wall and have left stains. And actually, I was having a conversation about that last weekend. I think those things come from dust in the air combining with moisture and getting stuck to the wall. Or, you know, if you have a smoker in the house, you get all of those icky bits in the air. But other people think that it's sun fading damage. So anybody know? Anybody want to weigh in? The light fixtures between the two places are also really different. And so are the spherical objects on the railing. However, what makes this really interesting to me is the wall. The wallpaper is the exact same in the other world. It's just more vibrant, which would suggest that it's newer and hasn't faded to time yet. Yet. And the picture frame stains in the real world don't match where the pictures are in the other world. And that's pretty odd considering the painting with the blue boy exists in both places. But the wallpaper alone suggests that the other world's pink palace was designed after a newer version of the house. It's the pink palace stuck in time. And I suspect that this version of the house is much older than when the sweet ghost girl was taken because the stairway is positioned in a location that isn't getting a lot of direct sunlight. So wallpaper fading this much should take more than a few decades. Although the fact that the other mother has a very different portraiture up all over the house, I don't know, something about that is really weird and it's bugging me because we have the silhouettes of the unidentified children in the dining room. Then we have the happy blue boy in the living room and everything else we can make out on the walls are pictures of the pink palace. So did the Bell Dam live there before? Was she married to the original owner? It's such an odd detail. And like so many others in the movie, it has no payoff. 
So I don't know what it means, but I feel like there's something to it. Oh, also, Coraline is still wearing the clothes the other mother gave her. And that could be a clue that Coraline is in a different part of the other world right now. Because those clothes would supposedly be made out of magic, and so they might not hold up in a real world setting. Anyways, Coraline looks in her dad's office and can't find anyone. But it is a great touch that her hair is super disheveled still. And then Coraline gets into the kitchen and sees her mother's groceries. You know, the groceries she went to go grab right before Coraline went to the other world. But as Coraline knocks the paper bag over, we see browning bananas, mushy tomatoes, and rotten fish, I think, falling out, along with a bunch of flies. And I do need to stress that these things look like the shape of a fly, not a gnat, because that helps give us a clue on how long the groceries have been sitting there. The tidbit I found here says that fly eggs hatch within one to two days of being laid and then the maggots mature to full-grown flies themselves within about three weeks. So, assuming the grocery store was selling clean food that didn't already have larvae in it, that would mean that these groceries have been sitting on the kitchen table for a 22-day minimum. So if this is truly the real world right here and now, then the other world is running on reverse Narnia time, where time is moving super slowly. Because it only seemed like Coraline was gone for one, maybe two days. And what's even stranger is that Mel came home and didn't put the groceries away immediately, suggesting that she walked in and went looking for Coraline right away, then got into a panic when she couldn't find her daughter. As a parent, that feels a little atypical to me. Although, Coraline did seem to leave the small door open last time she went into the tunnel, so maybe her mother saw that and went in too? I mean, hey, maybe she even found it open before and panicked and locked it. I'm not positive, but the whole grocery bag thing leaves us with a lot more questions than answers. Then the doorbell rings and distracts Coraline in a way that's eerily similar to what happens in the other world. Because there, anytime Coraline has a moment to process things that aren't making sense, something new happens that resets her focus and makes her lose her train of thought. And here, Coraline believes the doorbell is her parents for some reason. Because she's 11 and apparently not thinking it through that her parents have keys to get in and out of their own home home. However, Coraline is running down the hallway saying, I missed you guys. You'll never record screech. She opens the door and sees a cowering YB tilted to one side and wringing his hands like an anxiety riddled mess. And while Coraline is being annoyed that she's face to face with the YB that talks, YB starts nervously explaining that his grandmother is really mad that he took the doll that used to be her sister's. And and Coraline squints and realizes that YB stole that doll from his own grandmother. But real talk for a second, why was that specific doll important? If things like the clothing can leave the other world and be real and consistent in the real world, then why couldn't the Bell Dam just make another doll with different materials? Because the Bell Dam has gutted and changed everything about the doll other than the sack body it had. So the Bell Dam has materials and should theoretically be able to make more dolls. So using that exact same specific doll doesn't make sense. But YB tries to defend himself by saying the doll looked just like Coraline, so of course he wanted to give it to her. And Coraline rolls into a spiel about the doll previously looking like Pioneer Girl, and then Huck Finn Jr., and then the little rascal's chick, before realizing that the last ghost kid had to be Grandma's missing sister. But, uh, Coraline should have zero knowledge that the doll ever looked different. She was never told that the dolls are being remade every time, and there's no reason for her to assume that's the case. I mean, come on, this house is 150 years old. How many plush dolls being played with by multiple children do you think are gonna last 150 years? Something has to be special about the body of that doll. And Coraline tries to explain that she thinks 
she just met Grandma's missing sister, and YB rightfully gets a little freaked out. If he does work with the Bell Dam, I doubt he's aware that his Aunt Soul is trapped in the other world. But Coraline reaches out and grabs YB and drags him through the Pink Palace, just like other YB had done for her a few moments ago. However, this is a confusing moment for me, because YB looks so genuinely afraid to be inside of the Pink Palace, and he talks about how he's not supposed to be in there. And then we get this glorious top shot of the living room, where the floor looks like a spider web design. And yeah, I think these are all big clues that this is still the other world, and that this angle is a metaphor that Coraline is still trapped in the web. I know, we have the radiator over by the window there, and it looks like the real world one because it's larger, but if the Bell Dam is making and remaking multiple pink palaces, some details are going to get mixed up. Anyways, Coraline drags YB to the small door and says his aunt is in there. Not even really mentioning that, oh, by the way, she's dead. And YB wants to know if Coraline will unlock the door as he reaches for the key, but Coraline grabs his hand and tells him, not in a million years. So, another conflicting moment then. After just making a promise to the ghost kids, Coraline is going to make no effort to find their eyes. And on the one hand, good for her that she's finally realized the danger and is acting wisely. But on the other hand, it does not make Coraline look like a good person. Although Coraline does start talking about the situation where the ghost kids can't escape without their eyes, and she does look a little bit remorseful about it. But YB is starting to realize the danger signs himself, except he's not getting swirling red flags from the tiny door, they're coming from Coraline. And YB breaks away and does a back roll to get some distance between himself and Coraline, but he can't leave without that stupid doll. So Coraline says that's great. She would love to offload that doll. And she grabs YB's arm and drags him upstairs to her room. And Coraline is looking everywhere for the doll, talking to it out loud and calling it a monster, which YB gets more apprehensive about, and he tries to kind of diffuse the tension by saying, hey, you've been talking to my grandma? Because Coraline must sound as equally crazy. And holy guacamole! <gasps> When Coraline throws her squid plushie, it doesn't have the single pointed squid head like it did before when she was in her room for the first time and had never been to the other world before. That plushie that she just threw has two cat ears just like the one in the other world. So Coraline isn't actually in the real world right now and we just proved it because an object in the real world could be cloned and put in the other world, but nothing in the other world should be leaking over over into the real world like that. So it would be one thing if we saw the single point squid in the other world where things are being made and destroyed really easily, but there is no way that that cat-eared squid left the other world and got into the real world. Even the last time we saw it, Coraline had it locked in a trunk, so it wasn't even free to wander off her shelf and through the tunnel. Oh my gosh, I have vindicated myself after years and years of trying to insist that this theory was was right. And that leads me right back to reiterating that once Coraline goes into that tunnel, she never truly goes home again. But this whole time, YB is asking skeptical questions, and he's certainly getting wary of Coraline's mental stability, especially when she spouts off about the other world having better everything, but it's all a trap. And YB finally gets freaked out enough to say he hears someone calling for him, so he needs to go. However, Coraline can tell by his voice that he doesn't believe her, so she tells him to ask the cat. And YB at this point is too worried to even cross Coraline's path. He jumps over her bed and says he'll tell Grandma that they just couldn't find the doll. And this annoys Coraline, so she throws her shoe and hits YB because she's a jerk. And YB says he doesn't believe her because she's crazy and goes screaming and running out of the house. He jumps on his bike and takes off while Coraline is chasing behind him with her shoes in hand to use his missiles. And she calls out, crazy? You you're the one that gave me the doll! 
It has some real you dang kids get off my lawn energy to it. And scene. That was a lot to unpack, but OMG, we just proved it's all still in the other world. This script is running long, so here's some quicker comments to explore. Maximum Velocity 6664 explained that the Bell Dam's final dress, you know, the one with the weird bustle, looks like a lobster tail petticoat from the 1800s. And oh my gosh, those are real and it does have that feel to it. I've never heard of those. I've never seen those before. So thank you for sharing. Then Maydell Rosen said that the black cat is a Mephistopheles and Coraline fits into a Faust role. And that feels like an excellent observation, but I am not an English or a literary person, so I am not fully familiar with those characters. I mean, I've heard the name and I know Mephistopheles is the devil or at least a Satan stand-in, but please, those of you smarter than me, expand in the comments. I might be overthinking it, but that's literally my job. And to any of my members here on YouTube, a huge bottom of my heart thank you for all of your help and support. If you would like to become a paid channel member, there is a link in the description below. Thanks again, guys. Love you. Well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my own personal self, and I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And and sometimes people say, hey McGann, I want to mail you something. How do I do that? Easy. Just click the about tab on my channel page and my most current PO box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. People who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video. We should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.